Hey, Erin. Hi. How's it going? Good. How about you? Good. So you're, you're on vacation in Park City right now. Thank you so much for taking the time to connect. My pleasure. I'm excited. So just to introduce you briefly, you are a massage therapist, you're a yoga instructor, and you're a coach who works specifically with women around emotional eating and helping them to struggle, uh, to end the struggle with body image and any emotional eating problems that they have. So you kind of have this really wide range of ways that you work with women and ways that you support them to find vitality in their life. Mm -hmm. So exactly. yeah, so a lot of times, um, especially as I do these interviews and I connect with women, the work that we end up doing in the world is really a reflection of um, the process that we've gone through to heal our own bodies and our own lives. So I would love to hear from you a little bit about how you ended up being where you are today. Definitely. Thanks. Uh, so I guess if I start at the beginning, when I was in high school, I had an extreme eating disorder and I struggled for many years with it. And over time, like it, it was started as anorexia and became bulimia and it got better, but not like I still struggled with emotional eating and my body image a lot. And, um, when I was in college, I decided to become a massage therapist while I was going to school. And I think that's like probably the first step in my healing because it was all about like taking care of my body and other people's bodies and really just honoring how amazing our bodies are. Mm. And that sort of, got my journey going after that I became a yoga instructor and I remember this moment I was working with a client and she started crying on her massage table and I and we were talking about what she was crying about but I just wanted more tools to help her it was like massage only lasts for an hour but yeah. I wanted to have have tools to help people you know last a lifetime not just that short hour that I worked with them and so I went to school to become a life coach and it changed my life. It was so transformational, the tools that I gained. Um, so after that, I... <laughs> uh -oh. I avoided talking... Is our internet going out? Yeah, okay. There we are. I think you're back now. Okay, how much of that did you I catch? left off at, so you went to school to become a life coach. Okay, so after, after that, and I started to explore like how I wanted to work with coaching clients, I, I definitely avoided working with people on health and wellness. And, <laughs> and I avoided talking about my own struggle with food because it felt like this issue that was unresolved in my life. Mm. And the the turning point in my business was when I actually brought that into the light and, and shared my journey and shared how I still wasn't perfect, but I had learned so many tools along the way. And I realized that like, your struggle really is your best gift to share with the world. And so now that's what I work with people on, ironically, since I hit it for so long. But um, it's so rewarding because the way we feel about our bodies and our relationship with food can really affect everything else in our lives. So, so having an eating disorder and then being willing to share it is so, so courageous. And like you said, even you didn't want to, you didn't even want to share it, right? Someone who had gone to school to talk about this stuff still didn't even want to talk about it. So when you kind of stepped into, um, the courage and stepped into the heart to be able to talk to people about it. I'm sure that the response was really positive because it's that feeling of you too. Yes. You know? exactly. So what, how does, I mean like this topic of emotional eating, it's so prevalent and it's so relevant for so many people. And how do you see that it shows up most times with your clients? Like where, I mean, can you just talk a little bit more about it? Yes, of course. So it's funny because I could dive into this. There's so many different aspects of emotional eating. Um, a couple of different pieces that I will work with clients on. Um, one is we often will have cravings for specific foods, mm -hmm. and that will be oftentimes tied to memories we have 
that evoke a positive emotion. So when we're feeling upset, we want to recreate that feeling of love or happiness. And if we had, you know, ice cream sundaes with our grandparents every Sunday, then going to eat ice cream will recreate that memory subconsciously and make us want to eat that on a regular basis. Another type of emotional eating is when you're upset and you just want to eat everything in sight. It's not a specific food. It's just more in general, this like empty hole in your stomach and anything will, you, you know, you'll turn to anything to fill that. And the way that I work with clients on that, which we can dive into more about this, um, is usually when we get upset, there's like an unresolved part of ourselves from the past that never learned how to handle um, like rocky emotions. And so maybe it was like our five-year-old self who got made fun of in school. And that five-year-old self, whenever you feel scared or anxious about something, will always go to food because you never coped with that original, like you never learned the tools to handle those emotions. And food is the best way to handle it. And so I guess the overarching thing with emotional eating is that we put our emotions in the food and instead of just honoring what's coming up and, and being present with sadness or fear, we, we kind of like don't know how to use those emotions to kind of work through things. And so we turn to food to squash them down. Mm -hmm. that yeah. all makes sense? Okay. That totally makes sense. And yeah. This is making me think about something. The other night, um, my fiance and I were watching Seinfeld on like, I don't know, some online platform, Hulu yeah. or something like that. And a commercial came on and it was this girl like looking sad and alone in, in this room. And I, I thought it was a joke. We, it was me and him and our roommate. And I thought it was a joke. And it was talking about, it said, do you have BED? binge eating disorder, BED, they named it. They gave it an acronym to like really make it a thing. Do you have this disease? And if so, they were prescribing a, uh, a medicine to take for it. They were prescribing a, bill, a pill to take for binge eating disorder, which I was like, all three of us are like, this has to be a joke. This, what <laughs> is it? And it's like, it's exact. I mean, I was like, my face was flushed. I was just so angry because it's exactly what you're talking about is that we have all of these emotions that we, um, either because we're in, we're a mo in a modern world, we have so much going on in our lives. We just don't have the time or space to really look at them. Yeah. They get yeah. squashed or they get covered with food through the sensation of having either sweets or salty or fried. Most of the times when people are emotional eating, they're not emotionally eating carrots and apples. <laughs> right. Salty, fatty foods. And so I just saw this commercial and thought, well, my God, that's the very last thing that they need is something to have them feel less. If anything, we need to provide a safe environment for them to feel more and really take stock of what's going on in their life that they're emotionally or binge eating in the first place. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm curious because, um, like I said, there's so many people that who are dealing with this kind of thing. What are some of the ways, like it can feel really overwhelming. Like, you know, I used to have a history of emotional eating and it was, it was always hidden. I never wanted anyone to know it would be at night and it would always be like, um, in, in secret. It would be in my own space because I, I felt shame about it. So yeah. how do you start bringing to light and sharing like uh, techniques for people who are hiding this, right? So someone could be watching right now who's like, oh my gosh, yeah, I do that too. But it's so shameful to really talk about. So like what's one way to start um, healing this part of ourselves and to stop emotionally eating? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... I want, I want to go back to one thing you said about how we turn to salty foods or carbs. Mm -hmm. And this, this ties in because when we turn to those types of food, there's actually a biological reason. Those types of foods will boost our serotonin and kind of temporarily soothe us. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that I share that is because it all starts with 
being compassionate with yourself. The whole cycle of emotional eating is that we feel like crap and then we overeat or, you know, do something negative with food and then we beat ourselves up for it. And it keeps the cycle going of just hating ourselves throughout the whole process. And so really, if you want to stop that cycle, it begins with just giving yourself some compassion. And I really believe that every action in our lives is either an act of love or a cry for love. So if you're overeating, it's usually because you're, you're seeking out a soothing, comforting feeling and you're not getting it from the food. So that's, so the first step is just acknowledging it with yourself you don't have to acknowledge it to the world like i did with my coaching business but just with yourself like being honest can be a really brave thing and say like wow this is a cycle in my life and i must really be hurting right now for this to be going on mm -hmm. and then the second step is can i just say one thing about that before yeah, you yeah yeah definitely is that um in all of the women that I've been speaking to and, and doing coffee with Carly, whether it's fitness professionals, whether it's nutritionists, whether it's um, women who are talking about the cycles of the moon or whatever it might be across all platforms, everyone, uh -huh. same thread is stop beating yourself up. Just be, be kind to yourself. And, and you know, I wanna add that the way that you treat yourself is how everyone else learns to treat you too. And so if, you're the one beating yourself and speaking down to yourself and um, you're, you're showing other people that it's okay to treat yourself that way too. So it starts with like filling, being kind, being compassionate and filling ourselves up with so much love and sweetness. And then that pours over and other people can begin to respond to you in that way too. And it's just been, it's been this, this thread and this theme amongst every conversation that I've had. So there's gotta be something to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's, um, it's funny because when I was struggling with my eating disorder, I kept hearing that, like, love yourself more. And for some reason, I, it would frustrate me. Like, I would read these books and yeah. it would say, if you want to get better, you need to be kind to yourself and love yourself. And I thought that it meant, like, taking bubble baths or, you know, like, it, it didn't. I never really grasped the concept of how to love yourself. And I think it's because it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it starts with just being easier with what's going on and acknowledging that you are doing your best. And then once you can come to that place, then you can kind of take inventory and create something different rather than just going through the motions like you've been. So. Yeah. And exactly. Yeah. What you said. Step one, be compassionate, understand there's millions of other women and men who are experiencing the same thing. You are not alone. You, That's me, so many other women that I've talked to, like there are people, women are creating businesses about this stuff because we want to bring it into the light and say, listen, we've all been there and there's a way yeah. out in this light. So, okay. So you, so you began yeah. you say step one, begin with um, compassion. And that is a way to love yourself. It could look like a bubble bath yeah. or it could just be like, Hey, listen, it's, it's okay. It's okay that you're doing this. Yeah. So great. Okay. And step two, I think is to acknowledge that you are seeking something from the food and to at the same time, like have a conversation with yourself because your rational self knows that that food has no emotion. It can't love you. It can't like Sometimes talk to you like a girlfriend would, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so when you, I work with clients on this concept in depth because it really does feel like, no, I like as women were, or men, we can like have a relationship with chocolate where it's just like, I love this chocolate. Like don't pull it away from me. That would be awful. And so when we can start to have a conversation with ourselves and like, really explain this chocolate doesn't love you back it's not going to make you feel better long term maybe for a few seconds and then you're going to get mad at yourself again it's like this light bulb goes off cuz we realize like yeah why why am i doing this it's actually making me feel like crap it makes me feel fat it spikes my blood sugar levels you know a friend would not treat me the way that this chocolate or carb food does. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying, um, like distill it down to understand that the food's not actually 
like it doesn't care for you and it's not serving you or what would, is, is that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like and, um, when I work with my clients, I actually really love to do exercises where you have that, that analytical conversation, you know, like more logical conversation while doing something with your body. So I really like tapping or EFT, the emotional freedom technique, mm -hmm. um, or just having things where you're like stepping into this version of your body where you feel more confident and, and have this awareness because what I've realized with food is that most of the time we all know what we should be doing to be healthy. You know, there's so much information on the internet about what to eat, what not to eat, and yet we don't do it. And it's like our body is on auto autopilot. Like in our head, we're saying, you shouldn't eat those cookies, you shouldn't eat them, but your hand like still goes for it. Yeah. And so it's really, um, I really like to have it be something that your body understands the shift that's taking place and your mind understands, you know, they're both on board. <laughs> Can you just speak briefly about how you use EFT with clients? I know I'm familiar with tapping, but um, for those who aren't, I, or even how you use it specifically for this. Sure. So there um, are different points on your body that you just tap on with like two fingers. You'll go like this. And the thing that I like about it is that it's a little bit of a distraction while you're you know, when you are talking with a therapist, you can still really like try to say your words perfectly right and kind of like think it through. But when you're doing this with your body, it's just like, it distracts your mind and the shift happens so much faster for me, I've realized. And so it's like you are releasing this stuff on a cellular level. It's not just in your head, you're convincing yourself and then you leave after the session and it feels like you go back to where you were. The, the shift happens in a deeper level. They've shown that tapping and EFT can actually dissolve neuropathways. So if you dissolve those neuropathways that are aligned, aligning that food with a specific memory, then it kind of like erases the draw for that food. It's just like, you'll still have the memory. You'll still like the food, but you, you don't have that like tight connection with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So is that one of the practices that you use in, in your own healing process or have you come across that more newly? I used it for myself. I had, so for me, like one example, um, when I was in my eating disorder treatment therapy, they made me eat peanut butter to gain weight because it's, you know, high in fat. And after, like over time, I became addicted to peanut butter. Like I would eat half a jar a day mm. and I, it was like making me bloated and I had a lot of extra weight on my body because of it. And so I did this tapping on myself and the peanut butter. And I realized like the peanut butter made me feel like in my head, I had connected this peanut butter with healing. It was like, in order to get better in order to not be anorexic anymore I have to eat this peanut butter and so I just like continue to eat it yeah makes sense and so I like released that from my my mind and and really like talked myself through it and said no you don't need to eat this anymore you're not 90 pounds anymore you can eat whatever you want you don't need to eat peanut butter in order to be healthy mm -hmm. um and that really shifted things for me or you, another way that I use it is I will, um, like some people will have, um, an addiction to margaritas. Like they just have to have a margarita after work. It's their thing. And when I ask them what happy memories do you have associated with this? It'll be like, Oh, well, my best friend who moved away 10 years ago, she and I would always get happy hour margaritas. And it just makes me think of her. And then we get to the core of it and realize that that, memory of her best friend, that connection, that love is what she really is craving after work, after a long day. And so we'll, we'll do a visualization where it's like tapping and picturing herself kind of scooping the emotion out of that food mm. and realizing like it's the love and connection that you want to carry on to, hold on to. And then giving that to the friend in your mind, like passing it back and forth. So this is, this is kind of what I do. You'll scoop the emotion out of the food and then in your mind, imagining that you're passing that emotion of love or connection back and forth to this person who has, who you have a memory with. And 
and then kind of realizing through this visualization that that's what you want to hold on to and the food isn't necessary in order to have that feeling. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> yeah. Long in there, but there, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And it's just like, it's, it's like a little silly example, but in hearing you say that, I think about when I was growing up and we would have, um, um, like, the ice cream man who comes around. I grew up on Long Island. So we had the ice cream man and like, we would always be playing outside in the streets and we'd all run out and it'd be the summer day. And I would get some kind of like ice cream cone or ice cream thing. And now I like, I crave that. I crave the frozen treat because it makes me feel connected. It makes me feel calm. It makes me feel peaceful. And so it is really helpful to think about like scooping that feeling out and just embracing that feeling of feeling grounded and connected. And, you know, maybe I call one of my siblings and talk to them instead of like eating the ice cream cone in, in the dark alone. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a, that's a really helpful technique. Um, awesome. So is there, are there any other, are there any other like kind of go-to habits that you teach around emotional eating or is there also, it just depends on the person and what's, you know, what's unfolding for them? A lot of times what comes up with emotional eating when we, so another technique that I do is if you have some food in front of you, it doesn't, this works better just in general, um, like a plate full of dinner. And when you push the food away from you, I'll have my clients push it away from them and then we'll start tapping right away and just, I'll have them close their eyes and I'll ask them what age they are. And almost immediately, like something will come up. They'll say, I'm six years old and I'm standing in the kitchen. My mom is making dinner and my dad and my mom are fighting, you know? And so that memory, that little six-year-old version of you is the one that's like still scared and stuck. Your emotions get stuck in your body. And she's the one that freaks out when you can't have the food. And so when you push the food away, it really like heightens that, that feeling. Mm -hmm. And we'll work with that a lot. And, and a lot of, a lot of really brave and deep stuff can come up when you do that exercise. You can, for anyone listening, you can try it at home and just notice like it, it's almost it's so fascinating how when you push the food away this feeling of anxiety like no you can't take that from me I need I need food you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will come up another exercise is um throwing away so like eating until you're full you know and leaving some food on your plate and then throwing it away that can really bring up a lot. Like I still need to work on this because most of us had parents who said, you need to finish your food, finish your plate. I hate it. Food away. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) So, um, just being, I guess you don't have to throw your food away, but the point is that sometimes we'll eat more just because we still have that voice in our head saying like, you need to finish your food Mm -hmm. rather than stopping once you're full. Um, and One other thing that I was going to share is just another technique that we'll do is holding, like keeping food in your mouth and really tasting the flavors and not actually swallowing it, but just like, you know, letting the flavors kind of sit there, noticing the sensation in your mouth and like being more present and slowing down. That process can help you to be more mindful. And I always work with clients in a session on this because I think when I was struggling with food the most, like there's no way I would be able to slow down if someone said, you need to be more mindful. I was just too like uptight around food. I I really didn't have a healthy relationship. And so being calm and mindful, is like, well, maybe I could try it once, but it wouldn't stick. And so it's um, something that I, I say that because I don't want people to think like, okay, I'm going to do that on my own and then beat themselves up when they go back to their old habits. Yeah. Um, it's just a process and it's uh, something that we need to bring a lot of softness and compassion to because I think that with some addictions, it's cold turkey, you know, like smoking or alcohol. You just cut it off. But with food, like there's never going to be a day where you're not going to eat or have food in front of you or have people inviting you to dinner. 
And so we really have to bring a lot of love into the situation in order to find some healing and balance. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that it can be, you can invite in habits and practices and techniques and the support and love of a coach who's been there and can hold your hand along the process. And it's not like this is something that you're stuck with for the rest of your life. You might always, I always can go into emotional eating. I can, I know I can, but I have so many tools in my toolkits to be able to now stop myself, step back, get mindful and yeah, mindful, whatever that means. But this is now like a decade, you know, a decade in the journey. So mindful might mean something different for me than you. Mm -hmm. But um, there are all these tools that are able to, to assist you. And you might, you know, it's not like you're, you might never feel cured, whatever that means to you, but there are tools to support. And that's the biggest thing to remember. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I would say like, I, I kind of feel like we threw out a ton of stuff. Like I just gave so many examples of different techniques, yeah. but I would say like if I could just boil it down to one thing to take away is that everything is either an act of love or a cry for love. And so if you are struggling, beating yourself up is only going to perpetuate that struggle and realizing that you need more love is what will start to heal your relationship with food. And I really love that you said how food, our relationship with food is a reflection of how we feel about ourselves and how people treat us. For me, I really, when I began healing my issues with food, I realized that my thoughts and beliefs about food mirrored my thoughts and beliefs about money and how it was like this lack mentality. I'd have to like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so many similar similar words even that we use, like binge eating, binge shopping, you know. Wow. Um, so it does ripple into every area of our lives, our love lives, our relationships, everything. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I really enjoy about your work is that it sounds like you really take the time with your clients to go, to go back to go back into their past and say, let's look at where this began, at why this began, and then let's take time to, to heal that part. Instead of just saying, okay, what, you know, what do we need to check off the list in order to get you healthy, right? It's like, let me really focus on who you are, your individual situation, go back in time and begin to heal those wounds. Because we all have wounds, right? Even if it's from second grade when someone said something to you on the playground, like those things get stored in our bodies, which is also so where um, body work like massage and yoga, and I'm a yoga teacher as well, really come into play is to energetically move those things out of the body. Otherwise, it gets stuck and stagnant and we hold on to them and it gets stuck in fatty tissue. But we bring in these, in pra these practices to, for the mind, for the physical body, and for the spirit where we begin to have this holistic expression of, of feeling well and feeling vibrant in this world. Yes, yeah. I agree completely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, how then, it sounds a little bit like, I mean, I'm clear on how you work with your clients. Is it mostly one-on-one -on -one coaching or what's the best way for people to get in touch with you and perhaps work with you? I recommend going to my website. I actually have a, um, a free training on emotional eating where I will walk people through this, this um, visualization that I talked about where you push the food away okay. and it's like an hour long training. So you could just, you know, take an afternoon when you're feeling kind of stuck and listen to it. And um, that is on my website. And I also have, um, I think it's a five steps to end emotional eating and love your body um, freebie on there too. And I just love hearing from people. So if this resonates with you, I have a private Facebook group. Um, called Healthy, Wealthy, and Happy. And I also am available on email and Instagram too, but I, I work with my clients mainly over video chat. So it's, it doesn't, it's not just in person, you know, I work with people all over the world and um, I would love to connect. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Erin. I really appreciate it. And I just really honor and admire you for being willing to share your journey. I know that it's just a really sensitive thing to do. And thank you for being willing to. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It was so much fun chatting about this. Of you course. are just 
radiant. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dear. Enjoy your time in Park City. Thank you. I will. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.